for the seventh Sunday after Epiphany. We're very happy that you could join us. Today, we are resuming in-person worship with the same protocols that were in place prior to the latest closing. Uh, so that will be social distancing and of course masks are required. Services will, however, continue to be available on the YouTube channel. Looking ahead, a quick note, Lent 1 is coming upon us quickly, March the 6th, and we will be celebrating communion as well as having our annual meeting. So the service will be shortened uh, by focusing on communion as opposed to the sermon. But just so you know, individualized elements will be provided at our in-person worship. However, people may wish to uh, bring their own elements to celebrate. Uh, those joining us via YouTube are invited to gather their elements prior to the worship service. Again, this is all for March the 6th. Thanks again for joining us today. We acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the peoples with whom the Upper Canada Treaties were signed and our responsibility as treaty members. We are gathered on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek peoples. May we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Trust in God, delight in God. For God tends to the desires of our hearts and commits us to the bright day of justice. Do not fret, for God is near. We come to worship because God is good. prayer. Come closer to us, O God. Reconcile us to our brothers and sisters. Come closer to us, O God. Care for our aging generations. Come closer to us, O God. Forgive us for our wrongdoing. Come closer to us, O God. Protect us from our future families. Come closer to us, O God. Draw us nearer to each other through you. Embrace with us, weep with us, that we may be family again. Amen. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Merciful one, we are not what we wish we were. 
we are often only what we desire. We are love when we love one another. We are strife when we judge the other as less worthy than ourselves. We are how we consider the other. Help us, O oh God, to be so much more, more in who we are, more in how we act, more in what we dream, more in how we love. Let us become the more that you intended in your divine image. Amen. God is the deliverance of the righteous. Our refuge in time of trouble, God helps us, rescues us, and leads us into the bright day of justice and mercy. Amen. Welcome to our reading for all ages today, which is the seventh Sunday after Epiphany. It's also the third Sunday of Black History Month. And so we continue to give a nod to Black History Month in the reading for all ages. Today, a book that we've read often here at Georgian Shores, it's called Viola Desmond Wouldn't Be Budged by Jodi Nyasha Warner and Richard Rudnicki. So let's listen. Viola Desmond Won't Be Budged. Viola Desmond was one brave woman. Now come on here, listen in close, and I'll tell you why. It was a day with zing in the air when Viola set out on her way. She waved to Gladys and Susu, who worked for her at Vice Studio Beauty Parlor. Then she stepped into her car and drove away. Viola drove those winter wet roads with care. She had a meeting to attend three towns away, but guess what? She never made it there. First she heard a rattle, then she heard a clunk, and then her car began to shake. Quick, quick, Viola drove into New Glasgow, Nova Scotia to a garage. The mechanic said it would take some long hours to fix up the car, so Viola made plans to pass the time. She walked up the street and down until she came upon the beautiful Roseland Theatre. I'll watch a movie, Viola thought, and she stepped up to the window to buy a ticket for the show. Her ticket in hand, Viola found the perfect seat right down close where she could see real good. Then she felt a tap on her shoulder she looked up into the face of the usher. You have a cheap upstairs ticket, she said. You have to go up to the balcony. Well, said Viola, the, that cashier must have made a mistake. I'll just go on and buy me a main floor ticket then. The usher shook her head. No, you people have to sit in the upstairs section. Right then, Viola understood crystal clear what she was saying. It was 1946. Back then, the Roseland Theater, like a lot of other places in Canada, was segregated. That meant black people were not allowed to sit, in, to sit, stand, or even be in the same section as the white people. Viola felt sad. Viola felt scared, but most of all, Viola felt mad. Look, she said, I'm willing to pay the right price and this is the seat I want, so I'm not moving. Well, said the usher and went to tell the manager. Well, said the manager and went to phone the police. And before you knew it, all three of them came up to Viola to insist that she move to the balcony. But I told you Viola was brave, didn't I? She wouldn't budge one inch because she knew this seating rule wasn't fair to black folks. It was just plain wrong. So the manager and the policeman dragged her out of the theater in a real rough way. They took Viola to jail. Can you believe it? She sat on a hard bench all night long and tried to keep her spirit strong. 
The next morning, Viola was taken before a judge and charged with not paying the proper ticket price. She tried to explain that she was happy to pay more for a downstairs ticket, but they didn't listen to her none. Viola was charged a fine of $20, which was a whole lot of money in those days. Then she was free to go. Viola was glad to get back home to her beauty parlor. When people came by to visit, she told them what had happened to her in New Glasgow. The story made them angry too. So Viola and the black community groups in Nova Scotia decided to appeal her charge. A year later, in 1947, they faced the Nova Scotia Supreme Court, but the judges there sure didn't want to talk about racial segregation. They said Viola's case had been fair and they canceled her appeal right there. Still, Viola's bravery made a big difference. She inspired all kinds of people to fight against segregation, and by the late 1950s, it was against the law. So come on in and join me in saying thank you to Viola Desmond, a real hero who sat down for her rights. Good morning. The reading this morning is from Galatians 5, 13 and 14. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only don't let this freedom be an opportunity to indulge your selfish impulses, but serve each other through love. All the law has been fulfilled in a single statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. Our gospel reading today is found in the sixth chapter of Luke, reading verses 27 to 38. But I say to you who are willing to hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other one as well. If someone takes your coat, don't withhold your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks and don't demand your things back from those who take them. Treat people in the same way that you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, why should you be commended? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, why should you be commended? Even sinners do that. If you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, why should you be commended? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be paid back in full. Instead, love your enemies, do good, and lend expecting nothing in return. If you do, you will have a great reward. You will be acting the way children of the Most High act, for he is kind to ungrateful and wicked people. Be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. Don't judge, and you won't be judged. Don't condemn, and you won't be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good portion, packed down, firmly shaken, and overflowing, will fall into your lap. The portion you give will determine the portion you receive in return. Let us pray. God grant that the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight through your Son, Jesus Christ, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This is a time of division. Communities and families are fractured. People worry that when this time comes to an end, it will be difficult to heal the deep divides that have become evident. And into that chaos comes today's scripture. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Be compassionate. I hate that. 
be a Christian grown-up. Really? Do I have to? Be compassionate. In some ways, that sounds like an incredibly simple instruction, but its application is often challenging and complex. But that doesn't give us a pass. So how are we to be compassionate in these times? The civil discord in Ottawa and around the country seems to have further entrenched us at opposite poles. In an article last week, David Sherman gave a tip of the hat to American author Sigrid Ellis, who in speaking of events in the United States in 2017 said, Americans are really good at acute compassion but pretty bad at chronic empathy. As David noted, the same can be said about Canadians and the times in which we live. Give us a flood, a fire, a tornado, and we're right there. Ask us to think deeply and empathetically about serious, complex, and chronic issues facing our country, and suddenly it is beyond us. Be compassionate. That's not an injunction to perform feel-good tasks when the need arises. It's a direction to deep and thoughtful reflections, to serious considerations for the other, to be agents of change. Now, strangely enough, this idea, the idea of being agents of change, was part of the rallying cry of those who joined the original convoy heading to Ottawa. Looking at that through the lens of compassion, I see frustrated folks, often from small town Canada, who are feeling voiceless. Here was a way to make themselves heard, to join in something bigger than themselves, to feel not so alone in their ideology. But when you are feeling frustrated and voiceless, it's easy to be taken advantage of. And so it began. Voices using language that does not belong to Canada, not reflective of our laws or constitution, clearly imported sound bites and really odd ideas about how our government works. Through the lens of compassion, I am thinking that for some people it was very hard to see those ships at first. They were lost in the heady feeling of the crowd. And as Christians, we should understand that, the seduction of the crowd. It has the feeling of those gathered on Palm Sunday, welcoming Jesus with palms and celebrating. But later in the week, standing and yelling, crucify him, crucify him. We, as Christians, know how easy it is to be seduced by the crowd. When the flags showed up, we heard that the press were focusing on the few and not the many. But really, how many flags of hate is too many? How many white supremacists? How many? So, Naive to the point of willful blindness or seduced by the power of the crowd. Either way, there can still be compassion for those who feel frustrated and disenfranchised. But this is where it gets a bit more complex. At some point, compassion meets our call to seek justice. Compassion without justice is an empty gesture. I've heard and seen comments from many people, including friends and even some family, that the media is not sharing the whole story of what's really happening. Well, you know, I don't really need the media. I just need to talk to friends, people I know in Ottawa. And so these things I know. Seniors and disabled folk are afraid to go out. Groceries and other necessities are difficult to come by, especially for those whose mobility is impaired. The street is not safe. A young boy, 
who happens to have autism, and his mom were coming out of a pharmacy when a protester grabbed his mask, pulled it off his face, and spit on him. Women at the shelter feel they cannot leave and be safe because of the loud, angry male voices. Those who were not at the shelter feel afraid to go there, so women are seeking safe spots on the street to sleep in the cold of the Ottawa winter. And yes, it is true that a group of protesters were angry that the restaurants were still open, that were still open, required masks, so they attended a shelter and, the food and, and ate the food intended for those who are food insecure. Being compassionate does not mean that we say any of this is okay. And it's not okay to say it's just a few. That's deflection. Bystanders have responsibility. So we need to be Christian grown-ups. Beware the seductive power of the crowd. We all need to carefully engage our compassion for one another, but make no mistake. Our collective focus as a Christian community is now and always shall be, first and foremost, for the poor, the hungry, the disabled, the vulnerable. And we are failing them. Friends, be compassionate. Seek justice. But remember these words from Galatians. You were called the freedom brothers and sisters, only don't let this freedom be an opportunity to indulge your selfish impulses, but serve each other through love.
gifts of hope, gifts of warmth, gifts of possibility, practical gifts and gifts for dreaming. We offer all our gifts to God and we honor these gifts in prayer. Let us pray. Mercy is love, O oh God, that demands we put our skin in the game. God, bless our offerings as you have blessed our bodies and lives. Help us to give more of ourselves, hearts and resources, to see your merciful love embodied in all of us. Amen. We continue with one of our prior customs, lighting a candle for people and situations that we wish to hold in our hearts. I invite you to light a candle at home and lift up those for whom you pray. Today, I hold in my heart the families of the Kisikus First Nation following the discovery of 54 unmarked graves. We remember the children who never returned home. Again, I remember families who've lost loved ones to COVID, continuing to update our count. Ontario, 12,167. Canada, 35,114. And globally, 5.85 million. We continue to lift up, at least I do in my heart, victims of our current civil unrest. In particular, the mentally ill, the disabled, those suffering from food insecurity, women in shelters and now on the streets, seniors, and all who are living in fear. I hold in my heart families who are on the edge, particularly those split by ideologies around COVID. And again, the people of the Ukraine and those that you lift up today.
Let us pray. God who makes us one with each other, one with creation, one with humanity, one with divinity. We pray that we may be seekers and doers of mercy. Dwell in our vulnerability and intensify our compassion until we feel connected, reconciled, and whole. We pray for those near and far who have asked us to pray for them. For those worried about the future. For those traumatized by the past. For those responsible for the present. Grant us all a vision of ourselves cast in your eternal love, that we may live, die, and love as one world without end. Amen. And in the name of of the God of life and love, we lift our voices, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. journeys in love. Care for one another. Seek justice. Make peace. Embrace hope. The grace of Christ attend you. The Holy Spirit keep you. And the love of God surround you this day and forever. Amen.